Welcome once again to today's Heart of a Shepherd daily devotional. We are continuing our study of the book of 2 Samuel, looking today at chapters 20 and 21. Now, our, our uh, title of our devotional is Blood for Blood, a Call for Justice. I do invite you to open your Bible, follow with me as we look at these two historical chapters, Second Timothy, or Second Samuel rather, chapter 20 and Second Samuel chapter 21. Now, the prophet Nathan, you will remember, had warned David that the consequences of his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah would follow him to his grave, Second Samuel chapter 12. And thus, the sorrow haunted the king's life like a shadow. Uh, contrary to the king's wishes, for instance, Joab, who was one of David's captains, killed the king's son. Now, Absalom was dead and buried in a ravine under a heap of stones in 2 Samuel chapter 18. Now, David's army had been victorious on the battlefield and routed the men of Israel who sworn devotion to Absalom. Now, although his reign had been preserved, the death of Absalom thrust the king into an overwhelming grief that moved him to cry, Would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, my son, my son. Chapter 18 and verse 33. Now, Joab, learning the king grieved his son's death, rebuked him and urged David to express his gratitude to his soldiers or risk their resentment in chapter 19 and verse 7. Now, the latter verses of 2 Samuel 19 exposed a division among the people. The ten tribes to the north identified as the men of Israel and resented the men of Judah. David was, of course, of that tribe. Now, that brings us to 2 Samuel chapter 20 and the note that all was not well in Israel. Now, an insurrection led by a man named Sheba begins chapter 20 and beginning, really, verse 1 through verse 22. Now, who was Sheba? Well, the Bible describes him as a man of Belial. Now, Belial meaning a worthless man. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, which, by the way, was the tribe of King Saul. And Sheba openly opposed David chapter 20 and verse 1. In fact, Sheba expressed animosity towards the king and even went so far as to rally an army to oppose him in verse 2 of chapter 20. David, having promoted Amasa to lead his army, commanded him to rally the men of Judah and in three days pursue Sheba and thereby putting down the insurrection before he could retreat to the safety of a walled city. Amasa, however, proved incapable of rallying the men of Judah, for he had been captain of Absalom's army, chapter 20, and verse 5. And David, therefore, turned to Abishai, Joab's brother, and commanded him to pursue Sheba, chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. Now, when Amasa arrived too late to lead David's army, Joab beguiled Amasa and slew him in the sight of the soldiers. Now, David's men went on to put down the rebellion, and the conflict ended with Sheba being beheaded. And yet we have a growing rift. And that rift was between Joab, the captain of, the, of David's army, ever since the wilderness, and David himself. Now, you and I should note and remember Joab's flawed character and his irreverence toward David. For instance, he had slain Absalom, the king's son, and he stood by as, as his, Joab's men, brutalized the king's son's body. In 2 Samuel chapter 19, Joab reproached the king when he grieved the death of Absalom. And then in chapter 20, he defied David's authority and murdered Amasa, whom the king had appointed as captain of his army. Now, David had caused for not trusting Joab. But he did nothing to deter that man's ambitions, which we have seen again and again has been a pattern in David's life. Once again, we're reminded how David abdicated, now listen, 
abdicated his moral authority over Job when he commanded him to expedite Uriah's death. In other words, there's this shadow that hangs over the relationship between Joab, the captain, and David, the king, who was an adulterer. And so troubles, we understand, are beginning for, for Joab and David, and the clouds are forming on the horizon. Now, briefly, 2 Samuel chapter 21. Now, here we have a judgment, and it is mentioned in verses 1 and 2 as famine in the land. Now, as we come to 2 Samuel 21, we do find Israel enduring what is now three years of famine. And so we read in verse 1, David inquired of the Lord the cause for the famine. And the Lord revealed the famine was his judgment for a wrong committed by his predecessor, King Saul. You see, Saul had aggrieved the Gibeonites. Now, the Gibeonites were non-Israelites who lived in Canaan. They had a covenant with Israel that was established by Joshua in Joshua chapter 9. Well, Saul had broken that covenant. And so the Lord had prophesied against Israel that he would not heal the land until the wrong was righted. And so we have then David's pledge for justice. Chapter 21, verses 3 and 4. Now, as the head of the nation, David humbled himself, and we read that he questioned the Gibeonites about what they required to right the sin committed against them. Now, the Gibeonites, however, rejected an offer of silver or gold from the household of Saul. And so David then was moved to promise, What ye shall say, that will I do for you. In other words, David's urgency to make right the wrong they had been committed against Gibeon. Now, we read in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 5 through 9, what I would describe as blood for blood. The Gibeonites employed an ancient law of humanity that we find in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, and it demanded that justice be served by the deaths of seven men who were direct descendants of Saul. Now, the scriptures do not reveal, but it is probable that those seven men were implicated in the wrong that Saul had committed against the Gibeonites. Now, this is especially true when we remember that justice is not served when a man is put to death for the sins committed by another. God's law demands, and I quote Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16, every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Well, David agreed to the Gibeonites' demand, but he did once again spare Mephibosheth, who was a descendant of Saul, the son of Jonathan, the grandson of King Saul. Now, understanding the land was polluted by innocent blood, David, we read, took hold of seven sons of Saul, or seven descendants of Saul, and we read, For the land could not be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. 2 Samuel 21 and verses 8 through 9. And so we come to verses 8 through 14, where we have recorded the slaying of Saul's lineage. Now, we read that two sons of Rizpah, that is Saul's concubine, were slain. Also, five sons identified as the sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, were also killed. Now, we know from another passage of Scripture, 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 23, that Michael, the daughter of Saul, who also was the wife of David, was cursed by God to never bear children. And so it would lead us to believe then that these five boys that she raised as her own sons were perhaps the sons of her sister Mirab, I believe is the right saying, 1 Samuel 18 and verse 19. And so we read, David delivered them, the sons of Saul, into the hands of the Gibeonites. And we read, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord and were put to death in the days of harvest 
in the first days in the beginning of barley harvest. Second Samuel 21 and verse 9. Now, Second Samuel 21, you'll notice, concluded with a historical record of Israel's conquest of the Philistines and the slaying of the giants of Goliath's household. Now, a closing thought. You and I live in a troubled world. Civil unrest, violence, murders, injustices, drought, massive storms, famine, warnings of food shortages. It seems the troubles are unending. And sorrows and heartache abound in our day. And in desperation, suicide, sadly, has become a leading cause of death for both the young and the old. Many politicians, judges, and law officials, rather than be the ministers of God for good, have failed to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil, Romans 13 and verse 4. And tragically, like it was in ancient Israel, so it is today, there is no peace. And so we have a closing warning. When innocent blood is shed and there is no justice, God will judge the land. America's guilty of having taken the lives of some 65 million unborn children by abortion. Our nation is guilty of human trafficking. We're guilty of the failure to exercise justice upon those who are guilty Guilty of taking innocent life. Guilty of stealing and taking that which does not belong to them. And as a result of those injustices, God is judging our nation and perhaps your world, your nation as well. God help us. May you and I be a model of loving the Lord and serving Him and obeying His laws, His commandments to walk out a life that honors him, faithful and true. And may those of you who are parents and grandparents urge your children and your children's children to walk in the way of the Lord. Thank you for being a part of our daily devotional. I feel privileged that you choose to be a part of my day. God bless you and bye-bye.